Hi, Lester, WISH engineer. The WISH scientists and I have been uh, measuring human impact and researching human impact performance uh, and measurement technology for some time now. We've worked with both the power cube device and with a uh, load cell. These are the only uh, two systems that I have uh, found currently that provide legitimate data regarding human impact. Other systems exist on the market based on accelerometers mounted in boxing bags and in boxing gloves or wrist mounted. I'm not aware of an established cost effective commercial system based on an accelerometer mounted in a boxing bag of predetermined weight. So I've never worked with a system like this. If you're aware of one that's commercially available and that is cost effective, let me know. Established commercial wrist mounted or boxing glove mounted accelerometer systems are however quite common. On researching these systems in more detail, it became apparent that certain base assumptions were being made about variables such as the apparent mass behind the strike that would invalidate the values generated by these systems for the purposes of scientific study. As such, I have not bothered personally investigating uh, these approaches at all up to now. Load cells, on the other hand, are a well-established technology and uh, see significant use throughout industry to measure force. Strain gauge load cells do this by measuring the strain in certain portions of the device using strain gauges and extrapolate what the applied force is from this raw strain data. The power cube device, on the other hand, is a very clever design and is essentially a compressible block of open cell foam with a strike face on the front and a pair of accelerometers mounted at specific locations in the device. These accelerometers are used to measure the acceleration of the front face due to impact and are also used to confirm that the device is not itself being accelerated prior to impact to artificially skew the results. The power cube provides discrete single value outputs for each individual strike which are great for tracking performance improvements over time, but not necessarily for analyzing the details of a particular strike in any depth. The power cube also does not provide any impact force data, which, while I agree with the power cube inventor, is not a good overall measure of human impact, does have some value when analyzing impacts in detail. And more on this later. In addition, the overall unit used in the power cube, the Franklin, is a non-SI proprietary unit. And its value is assembled from the raw data using an undisclosed proprietary formula. So while the power cube is an excellent device for assessing human impact performance and addresses many of the problems associated with the use of load cells for human impact assessment, our preference is typically for the load cell when used in official scientific studies. Although both approaches have their pros and cons in terms of human impact measurement, we still prefer working with the load cell because it allows for the generation of time-based digital data in SI units of force that can be plotted, which enables more in-depth analysis of strike data. However, despite our preference for the use of the load cell in studying human impact, load cells do suffer from four major problems with respect to measuring human impact. I'll list those problems now and, and add a little bit of context and detail to those problems. The first problem is the rigidity and risk of injury in use of a load cell for human impact measurement. Load cells are fairly rigid platforms. Aside from a foam pad on the front plate of load cell, there is no give in the system. Striking a load cell with full force can lead to impact and joint injuries a problem which the inventor of the power cube correctly identified and addressed in his power cube design. The power cube solves the rigidity problem by being a built, as I said, around a big foam spring that gets compressed during a strike. In this regard, the power cube is better for athletes to use because there is less associated risk of joint impact injuries. Another problem associated with load cells in, uh, for use in human impact um, measurement is that strain gauge type load cells um, have a spring element inside of them 
that can interfere, or that I shouldn't say can interfere, it typically does interfere with the measurement of impact force. Um, the problem is related to that spring element. So essentially a load cell is itself a spring. And I'll read to you a little bit from uh, Wikipedia. Uh, strain gauge load, load cells are the kind most often found in, in industrial settings. Um, it is ideal as it is highly accurate, versatile and cost effective. Structurally, a load cell uh, has a metal body to which the strain gauges have been secured. The body is usually made of aluminium, ours is made of aluminium in this case, alloy steel or stainless steel, which makes it very sturdy but also minimally elastic. This elasticity gives rise to the term spring element, referring to the body of the load cell. When force is exerted on the load cell, the spring element is slightly deformed and unless overloaded always returns to its original shape. As the spring element deforms, the strain gauges also change shape. The resulting alteration to the resistance in the strain gauges can be measured as voltage. The change in voltage is proportional to the amount of force applied to the load cell. Thus, the amount of force can be calculated from the load cell's output. And uh, here is a photo of the spring element in our own load cell. So what would that mean? Well, the fact that a strain gauge load cell is essentially a spring does not typically affect the measurement of long duration and sustained forces such as weighing a mass or measuring a sustained push against the load cell for instance. And those are typically the instances in which load cells are used in industry, usually for measuring weight. However, when used to measure impacts, the natural frequency of the spring element comes into play and interferes with the measurement of, of the true impact force. This kind of interference takes the form of both constructive and destructive interference, artificially either increasing or decreasing the measured force of the impact. And here is an example of the impact waveform of a 5 kilogram dumbbell uh, dropped on the load cell um, from 500 millimeters above the surface without any padding on the load cell strike face. As you can see from the waveform, there is a slowly decaying sinusoidal oscillation that continues long after the initial impact has occurred. This is the system responding to the injected energy of the impact by oscillating at its natural frequency. Now here is a detail of the first part of that waveform showing some destructive interference from the system's natural oscillation which has deformed the impact peak and possibly locked part of the, peaks, uh, of the peak force off. So the third problem associated with uh, load cells is inaccuracy related to sampling rate. Different load cells have different sampling frequencies or sampling rates. What this means is that the hardware and the software monitoring the uh, strain gauges only samples data at specific points in time and does not sample data continuously. For instance, a load cell with a 1 kHz sampling frequency, such as our own, looks at and records the transducer's output 1,000 times per second. Now this may seem like a lot, but more expensive piezoelectric load cells often have sampling rates that are 10 kHz or higher. You pay for this though, as one of these load cells may set you back more than $40,000 as opposed to the $4,000 price tag on our own load cell. We could compare sampling rate to the resolution of a TV screen. If the image is blurred or pixelated, it will be impossible to make out all of the finer details. What details uh, you personally may be interested in seeing in a pixelated image is none of my business. But for the sake of the illustration, let's carry on. Within the pixelated image, there may be one or two prominent details that escape notice entirely because they fall within the area of a single pixel. In the case of the measurement of peak impact forces, because the impacts occur over such very small periods of time, the very tops of the peaks may well be lopped off by the lower sampling rate. Pixelated out by the low resolution, you could say. Thus, if you're looking at peak forces using a 1 kHz load cell, the peak values may differ significantly from those measured using a 10 kHz load cell. 
And finally, the fourth problem that I'd like to mention in association with load cells is a peak force assessment. The final major problem with load cells, and this is not actually uh, related to the load cell itself, but the very act of assessing human impact performance using peak force as the key performance indicator. Let me show you an example to illustrate this. This is a comparison between the impact waveforms for a 5 kilogram dumbbell dropped from 500 millimeters above the load cell surface under two separate conditions. One, without a cover on the load cell, and two, when the load cell was covered with the 55 millimeter thick foam pad that came with the load cell boxing kit when we bought it. As you can see from the graph, the graphs, the peak force achieved is vastly different. Without a cover, the peak force was in the vicinity of 5,500 newtons, whereas it only peaked at around 2,000 newtons with the foam pad cover in place. Here is another uh, comparison between impact waveforms on the load cell with the foam padding, except that the one of the tests, one of the tests is performed with a five kilogram dumbbell, and the other is performed with a five kilogram medicine ball. As you can see, although the medicine ball and the 5 kilogram dumbbell weigh exactly the same, the peak force for the medicine ball impact is significantly reduced at around 1,800 newtons. This happens because the medicine ball is relatively compressible when compared with the dumbbell, which reduces the peak impact force and spreads the impact cur curve over a slightly longer period of time. As you can see from this, the characteristics of the foam padding on the front of the load cell, as well as the characteristics of the striking object itself, significantly affect the measured peak force. Quantifying human impact performance by using only peak force directly in this way is thus highly situational, uh, situational and you could say is also questionable. Unless exactly the same load cells are used, between studies with exactly the same padding and with similar striking objects or body parts, direct comparisons between performances cannot reliably be made. The inventor of the power cube device also accounted for this problem in his design and decided to base his measurement protocols on energy and power instead. These are far more accurate measures in terms of generalized striking performance. However, as mentioned earlier, impact forces are still of interest in terms of impact measurement. Much of the research regarding the effect of various types of impact on the human body, for instance, has been done in terms of impact force. So, disregarding um, impact force entirely may lead to a loss of pertinent information. Based on all of these concerns regarding the pros and cons of both devices, I decided to develop and test a load cell strike face, which I call the impulse block. The impulse block strike face and the methodology that goes along with it is a bit of a hybrid of both systems, both the power cube and the load cell. See it as an alternative method of measuring human impact rather than direct competition to either the load cell or the power cube. The impulse block is essentially a big foam brick with an 8 mm thick composite G10 glass fiber strike face on the front, very similar to the power cube. These are some photos of the components, which included two 300 by 300 by 100 mm open cell foam blocks on top of one another. The 8 mm thick uh, fiberglass strike face mentioned earlier, a 10 mm thick closed cell foam pad on the front of the strike face, and a plywood base. The entire block was then covered in trampoline fabric, as you can see, which is both strong and durable. It's UV resistant and it's porous, allowing air trapped in the open cell foam to be freely expelled during an impact. After some deft spray painting, the Martel logo took pride of place on the completed impulse blocks. I built two impulse blocks for training and for testing purposes, and this is what the final impulse blocks looked like. The impulse block does not contain any accelerometers. Instead, it is a simple foam pad with a hard strike face mounted on the front of the load cell. This solves the problems associated with the rigidity of a load cell 
in much the same way as the power cube does. It allows the impulse block to be struck with full force, compressing the impulse block and reducing the chances of joint injury to this in the striking athlete. This does fundamentally change the nature of the force graph, however, because now the system has become a complex combination of multiple springs and reactive elements and spreads the impact out over a longer period of time. The two primary springs are the load cell spring element and the foam spring. This leads to plots that look very messy and complicated, like this one. As you can tell, directly assessing peak force from this waveform now is essentially impossible. However, what we can do to it is to assess impulse instead, which is the integral of force with respect to the uh, unit time and represents the change in momentum. In this case, because the data is sampled at discrete times, we can perform a numerical integration. And it's just a question of adding the force values up and multiplying this total by the time step, which in our case, for a, a one kilohertz sampling frequency, is one millisecond. Impulse, being a change in momentum, is equal to the mass of the impacting object multiplied by its change in velocity. Once we have the impulse, we can thus potentially calculate the mass or change in velocity of the impact, impacting object as long as we have one or the other of these two variables. As a test of this premise, we perform several drop tests with a 5 kilogram dumbbell at various heights. Some of the footage of the Wushu scientists performing these tests can be seen in the inset screen. Knowing the mass of the object allowed us to use the impulse to calculate the change in velocity. However, taking the entire impulse, uh, entire impulse uh, value would not have been of benefit because the dumbbell was ejected from the impulse block with some unknown velocity at the end of the impact. So in order to calculate the initial velocity of the 5 kilogram dumbbell, we have to know the final velocity of the dumbbell as well. Now this is a rough plot of a typical impact waveform not taking the interference from the spring element of the load cell into account. There is one point at which we do know the velocity of the 5 kilogram dumbbell, and that is the point at which the peak force has been attained. And the dumbbell is momentarily motionless just prior to reversing direction as some of the stored energy of the foam spring is imparted to it. So if you can imagine in your mind's eye, the dumbbell falls, compresses the block, and at some point it stops its downward progress momentarily before reversing and being thrown off by the foam spring reacting to it. This point is roughly in the middle of a typical impact waveform, as you can see. So we divided the impulse by two in order to look at only half of the plot. Now we have the mass of the impacting object and its final velocity, allowing us to calculate the initial velocity. Using the basic equations of motion, we were able to calculate the velocity of the falling 5 kilogram dumbbell at the point of impact in order to verify our calculations. And here is a comparative table of the velocities of various drop tests as calculated from the impulse by using this method and also showing the verification velocities calculated using basic equations of motion. As you can see, the method proved accurate within the expected range due to human error in terms of ensuring that the drop tests were performed at consistent heights. All we were doing, all the Wushu scientist was doing was holding it at a particular height and trying to get it at the right height, um, which of course is, is not, uh, not, an exact, um, uh, not an exact method, which means that there would be some error and that's, I believe, what we saw in the results. In the case of human impact though, how will we know either the mass or the initial velocity of the strike in order to calculate the remaining unknown quantity? The mass of a human impact is a bit outside the realm of what we can easily calculate because the human body is a complex collaboration of various subsystems and the limbs that, and limbs that can all potentially contribute to the mass of the impact. That is why in sports science, the mass of human impact is typically referred to as apparent mass. This is not simply the mass of the hand in a punch, or the mass of the arm, or the mass of the torso, or simply the mass of the full mass of the striker. 
and it will change depending on what type of strike is used. In fact, this is a very interesting variable that we would like to analyze in more detail. So mass is out of the question, which leaves us with velocity. In order to calculate the initial impact velocity, all that needs to be done is to mount an accelerometer on the athlete's striking point, whether it's a, a foot or a knee or a fist or an elbow or a head or whatever. Once the initial impact velocity is extrapolated from the accelerometer data, this can then be used to calculate the apparent mass of the impact using the same procedure that was used in the verification experiments. The impulse is halved and then divided by the initial velocity in order to get the apparent mass of the impact. This should be very interesting to analyze and plot for various types of strikes, both bare hand and also weapons based. I'm really looking forward to being able to look at this variable, apparent mass, in more detail. In addition, once we have the impulse data, we can also plug this into an, uh, an expected impact waveform shape based on the impact duration and type of impact and the nature of the impacting surfaces to extrapolate an expected peak force. This will hopefully allow for some comparisons with impact force related data from other previous studies. In addition, once the impact velocity and the apparent mass of the impact are known, it's a very simple matter to calculate both energy and power associated with the impact using other known variables such as impact duration. Using the impulse block should hopefully allow for a full and complete analysis of an individual human impact and may represent an alternative method for researchers who have access to load cells but who would like to adopt a hybrid approach based on impulse and impact velocity. However, many more tests and further development is required in terms of confirming that the impulse block method will work effectively. So watch this space for future developments in this regard. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you all next time. Cheers.